morning. Welcome once again to our Bible studies here at Bible Talk. Hallelujah. Here once again, being in Altamont Springs, Florida. Yes, we're still here. And uh, we're starting a new series. I don't know how long a series it will be. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a little bit different because if you are accustomed to being with us, typically we do line by line, verse by verse, often, often word by word studies in, in a different book. Mm -hmm. and, but I wanted to do a different kind of study uh, that, that may take us a few weeks. Alrighty. And this study is called The Evidence of a Redeemed Life. Okay, and I'm not sure how long it will take us. I, I don't know. Uh, we'll find out. Yeah. It'll however take us as long as it takes care, us. However long the Holy Spirit wants it. Because I, I think it's, it's an important topic, and it's one that's been rambling around in my brain for a while. So uh, the only way to deal with that is to get it out. Hmm. <laughs> Throw it on the table. Put it on the table. So, so that's what we're going to do. But before we do that, Mark will pray and ask God's blessing upon our time and our Jesus. study. Well, Lord, you say where two or three people are gathered, you are with them. Thank so, you. Lord, please come here and guide the discussion so it might bless us and everybody that watches it. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right. Okay, so as I said, this is a, this is a topical study. Uh, rather than a, a, a study in a particular book, uh, verse by verse. And as I also said, the title of it is The Evidence of a Redeemed Life. And the focus of this study is twofold. The purpose is to encourage us and help us understand how to examine ourselves as we are instructed to do in 1 Corinthians 11.28, among many other places, by the Apostle Paul and others. And secondly, to ensure that we, each of us, is presenting Christ to the world in the way that we should. Okay? There should be, if, if you are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, that should be obvious. There should be, there should be things that make it obvious. There should be evidence of that life in you. And that's what I want us to look at is how do we, how do we determine that? How do we, you know, the word says, that I just said, examine yourselves. How do we examine ourselves? Okay, in the let's let me start with this with uh, kind of a basic thing that I'm sure you're all aware of. In the flesh, we are all the children, the descendants of Adam, yes. and we bear and show his fallen human nature, with all of its failings, mm -hmm. to the world around us. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. and like Adam, we're all condemned to death. We are born condemned to death. For like, the, as the Apostle Paul wrote in the letter to the Romans, which we just finished, by the way, the wages of sin is death. So if, if we bear in our natural man that sin of Adam, well, then we're condemned to death because the wages of sin is death. That's simple, simple logic. And then the other thing is, um, it, Paul also wrote in the Romans and said, for the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is is life and peace because the mind set on the flesh is hostile towards God for it does not subject itself to the law of God for it is not even able to do so and those who are in the flesh cannot please God that's Romans 8 6 and 8 6 through 8 the simple truth is that all of those who are in the flesh cannot help but to do the deeds of the flesh displeasing as they are to the Lord. Mm -hmm. It says they're not even able to do so. That's right. That's yes. what the Word says. You're not even able to do so. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident. Yes. Where are you reading out of? Right now I'm reading from Galatians 5, 19, 20, and 21. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these 
of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So I will said, not. Will not. That's Galatians 5, 19, 20, and 21. Mm -hmm. So those traits or behaviors are not only evident, they are the evidence of a life lived under the generational curse of Adam. That's, those are the fruit of the lack of spirit. Well, like the fruit of the spirit, this is the fruit of the lack of spirit. Yeah, but these are the deeds of the flesh. It's not okay. I want to I want to make that distinction because that's where we're going to go with this. Yeah. That's the distinction between there are the deeds of the flesh and there are the fruit of the spirit. Okay. But so, but these traits that I just quoted from Paul, they're not only evident; they are the evidence of a life lived under the generational curse of Adam. For the sins of the father are visited upon the children and the children's children. That's Exodus 34, verse 7. That's what it says. And then it says that, by the way, in a few other places. And that's why there's talk about generational curses among a lot of churches today. So the character of Adam. Well, it's, uh, it is his character. It's, it's what's built in. It's in the DNA. And if the sins of the father are, are passed on to the children and on to the children and on to the children ad infinitum, well, in the flesh, when we're born in the natural, those sins are passed on to us. And the consequence of that sin is passed on to us. Yes. All right? So, but those behaviors, the, the ones I just mentioned, immorality, impurity, sensuality, that's what the world is accustomed to. Mm -hmm. And... Like it or not, that's what the world understands and expects. And in many, if not most cases, these deeds of the flesh are what the world enjoys and supports. It's common. Well, but, but they, you got to understand something. You know, if, if you're saved, if you're redeemed, and you look at these and you think, well, these are horrible. Well, the world looks at these and doesn't say they're horrible. They don't say that Im immorality, impurity, and sensuality are horrible. If they were, you wouldn't see half the things you see on television, in the movies, or that you hear on the radio. Because they're, 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 they're filth. Yes. Well, why are, they, why are they on the radio? Why are they on the television? Why are they in the movies? Because the world loves them. Yes. <clears throat> so, you know, don't think that these things, as abhorrent as they are to God, and they should be to us, don't think that they are abhorrent to the world. The world loves this stuff. Factions, dissensions. You look at reality television, and there's always conflict. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's because the world loves conflict. It loves those factions. It loves those dissensions. It, it loves those disputes. You hardly ever see a reality show that's not filled with them. Well, that's what feeds the flesh, doesn't it? Well, it, it does. Mm -hmm. the, the flesh loves the deeds of the flesh. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I think... Somehow, uh, Christians, you know, we get to the place where we think, oh, these are horrible, and yes, everybody thinks they're horrible. No, not everybody thinks they're horrible at all. And even whether, whether it's real or fake, you know, for years, I mean, when I was a little kid, I, and televisions had screens that, that big, and people would literally put magnifying glasses in front of the television. That's what it, you wouldn't remember this, my, my brother. But I can remember going to my grandmother's house and she'd be watching the wrestling. And there was uh, Hat Pin Hattie, yes, and uh, Gorgeous George. And wrestling today is still a gigantic thing. I, everybody knows, I pray everybody mm -hmm. knows, they that know. it's phony. Yeah. No, they don't. Okay, well even if they don't, what it's about and what they love about it is the disputes, yeah. the conflict, the violence, the deeds of the flesh. Yeah. But, you know, even we ourselves, when, when you get angry, if you give in to that anger, it, real, it feels good. Your flesh loves it that. It feeds the flesh. Yes, it feeds the okay, flesh. Okay, but that's my point. So, you know, when we talk about these deeds of the flesh, and Paul mentions them in Galatians, these are like, okay, here are the horrible things. Well, the world doesn't think that they're horrible. And you have to realize that. And you're, here's the thing, more importantly than understanding that the world, your flesh doesn't hate these things. No, your flesh loves your it. Your flesh likes this stuff. Yeah, it feeds on it. Yes. Okay. If you walk in the flesh. So, they don't, the world, they don't understand 
And surely they don't know and they don't care that God spoke through the prophet Isaiah a long time ago and said, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, yes. who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter, mm -hmm. turning, thing, th turning things upside down. We live in a world where everything's turned upside down. The bad is called good and the good is called bad. And the evidence of that is out all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's getting worse every right. day. But that is the generational curse that flows through and to the offspring of Adam for all time. And there's only one way to break that generational curse. Mm -hmm. Change fathers. That's right. And that's why when Nicodemus the Pharisee came in the night to Jesus, Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John 3.3 3. You've got to be born again. You've got, and when you're born again, now Nicodemus didn't understand that, and Jesus went on to explain. He went on to say to him, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit, John 3, 6. So the redeemed, and that's what we're talking about, the evidence of a redeemed life, the redeemed then have a new father who is spirit. That's what Jesus said in John 4, right? John 4, 24. And they have new life. That breaks that generational curse. So if we have new life in Jesus, that demands a new life style. Yes. And that's why it's written, and this is Paul writing to the Ephesians, and he says that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit. Ephesians 4.22. So, you know... You've got to put aside that old life. Paul also wrote in, the Rom in Romans and said, you know, we're not to be conformed to the world. We're not to be like the world. But we have to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Mm -hmm. right? Then Paul goes on, and this is what's important. 2 Corinthians 13, 5, he says, Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test. This is the word of God. Now remember, Jesus in Matthew 24, when when uh, the, the apostles came to him and said, "You know, tell us what will be the signs of your coming in the ends of the time." Right? Mm -hmm. He said, "Unless the time was cut short, even the elect would be deceived." Yes. yes. All right. Mm -hmm. We need to be tested. Um. So, how do you examine yourself? And when was the last time you ever did this? When was the last time you actually said, okay, if, if, if I'm redeemed and there's supposed to be a new lifestyle, do you actually take time to examine yourself and look at what's going on in your life? Because that's what the Word of God says we're supposed to be doing. Yes. And I don't think that that's a habit that we've developed in the church. I don't think it's one that's encouraged. I don't think it's one that's taught much. Okay, so that's what we're going to do now. All right. So our ability, but now remember what he said, right? Let me just go back. He said, examine yourselves. Do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? Mm -hmm. So our ability to live this new life and walk according to the Spirit, that's what we're supposed to do, Romans chapter 8, right? We're supposed to walk according to the Spirit, right? is knowing that we have the power. Because as Paul wrote to the Galatians, it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Galatians 2.20 To put it bluntly, what that means is that we are not living that new lifestyle. Uh, if, if, we're, if we're not living that new lifestyle, we don't have any excuse. We have no excuse for not living that new lifestyle. And I hear excuses all the time. Well, that's the old me. I, you know, I've always been this way. No. You see what? When you were born again... That was a cut. That was a break. Separate. Separate. You became a new creation in Christ Jesus and Christ Jesus in you. God never calls you to anything that he doesn't equip you and empower you to do. Amen. Okay? So there's no excuse. And the only if you find when you do this examination that you're falling short, 
the only course of action that you have is repentance. That's it. You know, listen, we all fall short. That's what the Word of God says, right? We all, we all make mistakes. We all fall short. So when you examine yourself, and this is an ongoing process, and you find, well, gosh, uh, this is what the Word says, but I'm not really living up to that. Don't make excuses. Don't say, well, that's the old me. Forgetting what lies behind, I press on to the goal, Paul said. Change your mind. Right. Changing your mind, metanoia, is repentance. Mm -hmm. That's the correct course of action. When, this is the purpose of examination. God, you know, in the world, I think a lot of kids, particularly in school, they think, well, testing is to get you to fail. No. Testing is to find out. What you're lacking. Well, two things. What you lack, what you know and what you don't know. What you're doing right and what you're doing wrong. But that's not to bring condemnation. Jesus didn't come to bring condemnation. The things that you're doing right, God wants to strengthen and encourage. The things that you're doing wrong, you need correction. And where does the correction come from? Well, Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that all Scripture is God-breathed and profitable for correction, for reproof, for training in righteousness. We need to be trained in righteousness. We need that training in our lives. Okay? Yes. So, excuses. Get rid of the excuses in your life. Otherwise, you're in serious trouble. Because excuses are the fiery arrows shot from the pits of hell to kill repentance. When you make, when you make an excuse, you'll never repent. And if you don't repent, you're not going to change. And God's purpose is change. Bringing us from glory to glory. That's to glory. exactly what the Word of God says. Yes. He is transforming us, bringing us from glory to glory. That's His purpose. Yes. Why? Because His pro that's His purpose. Mm -hmm. To fulfill His promise and His promises that whom He foreknew, He predestined to be conformed into the image of His Son, Christ Jesus. Yes. So He's in the process of changing us from that old thing that we look like when we look like Adam into looking like Jesus Christ. That's, our, that's what God is doing while we are here. And He does that through His Word. We should be able to see that change in our lives. You know, the change in your life should be noticeable. That is, that change is, the change that you see is the evidence of your redemption. It is the evidence of your redeemed life. So that's what we're talking about. And I think that we can recognize it in our own lives when there are the things of the world become less and less attractive to us. I mean, well, I, absolutely. The, deeds of the, the things of the flesh. Right, right. Okay? The things of the flesh. The, all, all of those things that I mentioned from the Word, right? Those are the things that they become less and less attractive to you. They have, they have less and less of a hold on you. Well, that's, that's why, remember, it says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Right? So... Who, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the adversary. That's Psalm 107, verse 2. Okay? Let the, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Why? Because he has redeemed us from the hand of the adversary. We've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb and set free from the curse of the flesh. Before that, we were like those who are in opposition now. In the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him, to do His will. 2 Timothy 2.26 That's what it says. Before you were redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, you were held captive by the devil to do His will. People, people think, you know, well, I was my own man. You no, know, you want to know something? That's, that is stupid. You are never your own person. You are either going to serve God or you're going to serve the devil. Right? You, and and, no, and as Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, no man can serve two masters. No. That's but, impossible. You know, it's like you, you see all these kids. And by the way, this is nothing new. It says in Proverbs, there's nothing new under the sun. I was like this when I was a teenager. I think, you know, to, to a greater or lesser degree, all of us were. But I see, you know, these kids, they want to be individuals. They don't want to. And go to the mall and look. They all look identical. They all wear the same kind of jeans. They all wear the same shirts. They all the girls are wearing the same shoes, so they can look like individuals. They want to, look, they want to look different, but they look the same. They are in bondage to the fashion. Yes. 
They are in bondage to somebody else's decision. They didn't decide to wear those clothes. Somebody else decided for them. They are in that grip of the devil, all right? Mm -hmm. So, what we want to do in the course of this study is to take the test. Okay. Right? To see if we're in the faith. Mm -hmm. To see if we're living, you know, that, that, that redeemed life. To see if we have in ourselves the evidence of that redeemed life. Okay. What's the test? By what standard do you test yourself? And how do others examine you? How do others test you? The fact of the matter is, any test has to have a standard. Okay? Our standard has yeah. to be the Word. Well, it's a little scary because in the world that we live in today, I think probably for the first time, at least yes. in my knowledge of history, where it's like tests are being thrown out. There's no standard. That's ridiculous. There has to be a standard. There has to be something that you are measured by. And that standard should be objective. In other words, it doesn't change day to day. It doesn't change with the wind. It doesn't change with the wind. All right? It's the same. Well, the Word of God, Jesus is the Word made flesh who dwelt among us. And He is the same yesterday, today, and yes, forever. God is not a man that He should change, the Word says. There is that objective, unchanging truth that is the Word of God. <clears throat> Let's just look at this. Jesus was always tested. Okay? Who was he tested by? The Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious people. Satan and his apostles. How about God the Father? Oh, yeah. yeah. Right? Because when, when God the Father, on different instances, when he at the baptism with John, mm -hmm. up on the Mount of Transfiguration, yes, and the Father says, Behold my Son in whom I am well pleased. Mm -hmm. Doesn't that mean that the Father was watching the actions of yes. Jesus and saying that what He did was pleasing to Him? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So He was testing Him. Against what? You're always tested by God. Here's what you're supposed to do. Did you do it? He did it. I mean, it's that simple. It really is that simple. Well, He did Are what you, He was commanded. He, he, did, yeah, was, he, he did the Word. That's right. God watches over His Word to perform it. Jesus said he never spoke anything that he didn't hear the Father tell him. He didn't do anything that he didn't see the Father do. It's always being obedient, you know, doing what God is instructing him to do. He never failed to do that. So God the Father could say, Behold my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Yes, he was tested, he was tested by the Pharisees and Sadducees, the scribes, all the time. But they were testing him by their traditions, not by the word of God. Aha! That is exactly the point. There has to be a standard. Mm -hmm. Well, the Pharisees had a standard. Yes, they did. But it's the, the wrong standard. Yeah. Just in, in the account in John chapter 9 of a man who had been born blind, all right? Yes. This is really a good place to look at this and to see this. If you don't know that account, it, it would be good for you to take some time at a different time mm -hmm. and go read that. Because, by the way, it's one of the Bible studies I think we have up on the website on BibleTalk.com. Mm -hmm. In, in verse 9, or in verse 16, John chapter 9, verse 16, it says, Therefore, some of the Pharisees were saying, This man, talking about Jesus, is not from God, because he does not keep the Sabbath. And then, in verse 24, So a second time they called the man who had been blind, and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man, once again Jesus, is a sinner. So they had tested him and found him to be a failure. He didn't live up to their standard. He didn't meet their measure. He didn't test out good. But they said it was because he didn't keep the Sabbath. Well, the fact is, the simple fact is, Jesus fulfilled the law. He never broke the law. It was the traditions of those religious people that he did not keep. And it was for that that they condemned him. They had come to believe that the traditions that they created and that they held so dear carried the weight of the word. Mm. So Jesus said to the Pharisees and scribes, this is Mark 7, right? He said, neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the traditions of men. 
He was also saying to them, you are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your traditions. So they were testing Jesus, but they were testing him not according to the Word of God. They were testing him, this is exactly what he said, according to their traditions. He didn't break the Sabbath, but he didn't hold to their tradition of the Sabbath. Sabbath. The commandments of man, right? He held or he he held to what it was supposed to be. Absolutely. Absolutely. But so you have to understand that when you test yourself, when you examine yourself, you have to test yourself against the Word of God. Nothing else. Nothing else. It doesn't matter what people think. It, all right? But people will always try and get you to meet their standards. Standards that they have established, not the standards that God has established. Because you'll be challenging them. Right. So you're either going to be tested by tradition or you're going to be tested by the Word. So if you're tested by tradition, people are going to look at you and you want to know something? I'm talking about the unsaved and the saved. Saints and sinners alike more often than not, are going to test you by their traditions. How often do you go to church? That's not even correct because you are the church. You never go to church, right? How much do you tithe? Uh, did you put Christ back in Christmas? Do you belong to the right denomination? Do you eat the right foods? Do you wear the right clothes? Do you baptize in the right direction? I mean, these are all the traditions of men, but that's what most of the church looks at you to see whether you're a good Christian or not. The world, most of the times, they don't even care. They're not even paying attention, all right? But, so, there are far too many of those kinds of questions to ask here, to even think about. They simply don't matter in any event. And our redemption doesn't, isn't based on what, what you wear, what you eat, right? Not, not those, word, those works. It's a, as a matter of fact, it's those things that we show as important to the world, as the basis of Christianity, that are very the very things that hide the truth of God's love and His amazing grace. When the world, the unsaved, the unregenerate, when they look at the church and see us saying that these are the things that are important, that these are the signs of a redeemed life, that this is what makes you a good or bad Christian, is what kind of clothes you wear, how frequently you show up in a church, all those things, all those tradition of men, we are hiding the love and truth of Jesus Christ from the world. Now, are we supposed to be doing that? I don't think so. Not at all. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, right? I read 14 and 15. You are the light of the world. Mm -hmm. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand. And it gives light to all those who are in the house. What, while Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount that we're the light of the world, these very traditions that I've been talking about, and, and more, they become the very basket that hides the presence That's of right. Jesus in our life. So what is important? What is important? Okay, I'm going to get to that since, yeah. you, since somebody jumped in. Okay, so our purpose in life is to show forth the excellencies of him who has called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. That's what Peter wrote, right? Mm -hmm. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Paul wrote to the Corinthians and said, But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of Him, Jesus, in every place. We're ambassadors for Christ. We're supposed to be bringing that presence of Christ into every place. The traditions that we have built in the church hide Jesus from the world. They don't reveal Him. They cover Him up. That's yes. a basket. So, but we're supposed to be imitating. That's important. Yeah, well, uh, Ephesians 5.1. Paul wrote and said, be imitators of God beloved, as beloved children, walking in love. So that's where we're going to go, right? Men, think about this now. Men and women in the world cannot see your spirit. No. All right? Think about what, what God spoke through the prophet Samuel. 
But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance, talking about David, right? Mm -hmm. Or at the height of his stature, because I have, oh no, Saul he's talking about now, right? because I have rejected him. For God does not see as a man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Mm -hmm. That's because he's talking about Saul, the first king of Israel, who the, the, the people of God thought, well, man, he is to catch me out. When was the last time you ever heard that expression, right? He was tall and handsome. He was the perfect, you know, he was the Hollywood image of what a king should be. And then when God rejects him and sends Samuel to anoint the new king, and he goes to Jesse's house, and there he finds Jesse, the father of seven sons. And he goes through the sons, starting from the first, the oldest, mm -hmm. until he gets to, there's one more. Where is he? Where is he? Where is he? He's out tending the father. Yeah, the little David, the youngest, the least mm -hmm. of all the brothers. The servants. Yes. Because God doesn't judge by those outward appearances. He looks at the heart. Mm -hmm. And David had a heart after God. Okay. So the world can't see your spirit, but they, they see the fruit of your... No, no. They don't see the fruit of your spirit. They can see the fruit of His Spirit in your life. So now, if you're not going to be tested by those traditions, the only other alternative is you're tested by the Word. And like, think about what Paul said about the Bereans. Remember the, the, in Acts? Yes, they were more noble-minded. They were more noble-minded because they tested everything that Paul said against the Word. They were noble-minded. We need to be noble-minded. We need to test what we say ourselves right. against the Word. We need to test what we do against the Word and see if we line up right. Jesus said, how do you tell if a person, how do you tell if a person is right? How do you tell if a person's doing right? Jesus said, so then you will know them by their fruits. Matthew 7, verse 20. Therefore, an examination of yourself that seeks to see the evidence of the Lord's redemption in your life should seek to find. Now listen to this. We're back in Galatians chapter 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. So, that's Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Mm -hmm. If you're going to examine yourself, and that's what, again, that's what the Word of God says, to see if you have this evidence of a redeemed life that's going your, on. Your new nature. Yes. This is the new you. This is the life because of Christ who lives within you. Yes. Because you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. These are the things you need to look for and see if they are blossoming in your yes. life. Operating. Are they operating? Are they visible? Yes. Not only, they, they, first of all, they have to be visible to you. Because if they're not visible to you, I promise you they're not visible to the world. No matter what the world throws at you, your response should be one of those. Yes, because these are in contrast. Now, remember, talk about the flesh and the spirit. You got the deeds of the flesh, mm -hmm. which I read first. Mm -hmm. Then you have the fruit of the spirit. The world lives in the deeds of the flesh. The children of God are supposed to live and walk in the fruit of the Spirit. That's how you test. That's how you examine yourself. Are the fruit of the Holy Spirit, those fruit, are they in and operating in your life? Because every single day you are confronted with choices. Lots and lots of choices of how you will respond to the circumstances in your life. You will either respond in the spirit or in the flesh. There's no in between. Yes. No. The redeemed, and we are the redeemed of the Lord, and we should say so. We are supposed to be responding with the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Yes. Okay. So, I think... And as brief as this has been, I think we're going, we're going to stop because what I want to do over the next few weeks is I want us to look at what these things are. 
and how they should be operating in our lives. And we need to be honest with ourselves and say, is this the way I'm living? Is, what, is this the way I'm responding? Because if you're not, if you don't have that evidence of the re God's redemption in your life, you need to repent and change. Don't be deceived. Don't be fooled. Okay? Let me just say this, because the first one we're going to do next week is love. Because that first fruit is the gateway to all the others. If you don't have love, I promise you, there's no reason to go on and check the exactly. others because they're not there. Right. And so I'll start next week when we talk about uh, I'll talk about maybe I'll have Alice and Mark do a, do a little duet for you. The 1955 hit song, Love is a Many Splendor Thing. Uh, that's we, we can practice, Mark. <laughs> because, I mean, what we're going to do, the first thing you have to do is understand what, what is love is is you've got to be able to define love all right and sammy fain and paul webster wrote a song and they said oh i can tell you what love is love is a many splendor thing well i think when we get as we go on into our bible study and uh, in our next session we're going to take a little deeper look yes. than just being a many splendor thing and we're going to find out what true love is because you know what Everybody out there thinks that they know what love is. And very, very few people do. We, the redeemed of the Lord, we need to be showing evidence to the world of what true love is. And you want to know something? It should astonish them. So Father, until that, until that next time we get together and examine not our love, but your love that you've poured into our hearts through your Holy Spirit. And we give you thanks for it. Lord, just help us to be honest with ourselves, Lord God. Not to try and hide anything from our own selves. Help us to humble ourselves before you and before ourselves, Lord God. And be honest and examine whether we are living that lifestyle that we should be. If we're walking in the newness of life that glorifies you and you through your Son, Christ Jesus. We just praise you and thank you for your word which you gave us to instruct us, to lead us, to guide us. Lord, and above all, for your Holy Spirit sent to lead us into all truth that not only shows us the truth, but empowers us to live it. We just praise you and thank you, Father, in Jesus' precious name. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 So don't you miss the next time, because it's going to be good as we get into the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the evidence of a redeemed life. But before we go, I want you to know, because Alice wants to tell you, Jesus loves you a lot. God bless you till then. Bye-bye.